Hello and welcome to the Synthetic Podcast. I am your host, Synthetic. What's going on, sissies? So, disclaimer, before I get started, I know sometimes I hand these out too late after I've been talking for like a half an hour. This is not going to be one of those really uh, salacious, sexually explicit uh, episodes. So, if that's uh, if that's what you're looking for today, this isn't one of them. I know, I know sometimes, you know, when I whenever I make a title for the podcast episode and I put that out there I can clearly see you know what's obviously more exciting to everybody to uh to listen to I get it but uh this is you're not this is not going to be what you're getting uh from me today so just keep that in mind if if you need to skip this one and wait till um the next episode which is actually I'm going to be talking about uh it's going to be one of the salacious ones a bunch of different people I follow on social media with whether it be trans performers or uh, cross dressers and whatnot. That one's going to be a little bit more hardcore than my average episode. But this one, this episode is going to be the third installment of my inspirations. The uh, the first two episodes for the inspirations were episodes 12 and 13. And I basically am going to uh, continue with that. And just like episodes with... Uh, you know, in regards to uh, my inspirations and whatnot, I talk about what I like about the things that I'm mentioning, and then why I, uh, I guess I get um, inspired. Like, what things in particular inspire me, and then how I incorporate that in my cross dressing. And if you're new to this podcast, I make uh, videos and you know, content and OnlyFans, and you know, with uh, with the smaller clips like the previews and trailers and whatnot, I post on Pornhub and X Hamster and FetLife and stuff like that. So, uh, artistically, I am very uh, impacted by all the people that I've mentioned. But before we get to that stuff, we're going to do some updates if, uh, if I still have you around. So, I have mentioned on uh, one or two occasions where I, uh, I had a run in with my mom. <laughs> so, I have mentioned before. But I have a tiny apartment now. I don't own a, I don't own a nice size house like I did before. I sold it uh, through no fault of uh, anybody else's except my own. And because I have a, such a small apartment, I don't. I, all right. So I have a utility room that I have more than enough space space for if I were to buy a washer and a dryer. I don't want to. I want to fill it up with all my cross-dressing shenanigans, and that's what I did. I bought a full-size industrial um, rack for hanging clothes on and whatnot, and that's what's in my utility room, along with the, some boxes that I have for all the lighting that I have up in my fucking apartment that I'm turning into a studio, I guess. Uh, but anyways, I say that to say that because my mom lives really close, and she doesn't mind me stopping by for whatever, whenever, I go over there to do my laundry. And as I've mentioned on many, many occasions, that sometimes, depending on you know what's going on with uh, with some of my content, or if I have a friend over, sometimes some of the things I'm wearing they get messy for one reason or another, and that just like my normal clothes, they need to get washed for one or several reasons. Sometimes when I go over there and drop off the clothes. I start the wash cycle, and because it's not so long, sometimes I come back home, and then I intend to go back over there to switch it, and then obviously I have to go back there again to pick it up when it's done. Most of the time, my mom, for whatever reason, she's just not home, or nobody's home, her or her husband, and while I'm at home, she'll be like, send me a message or a call like, oh, I switched your laundry, or oh, you know, I've seen you stop by, I'll switch your laundry for you so you don't have to. Totally appreciate it. That being said, sometimes I have a sweater dress or uh, something that, you know, like a hosiery, uh, thigh-high stockings, that clearly uh, is something that your woman, your average woman would wear. And I, I said several episodes ago that I, uh, I had my cousin in town, this is like, I think, almost two years ago now, for, uh, for I think, Christmas or Thanksgiving, 
and she was asking him if I was dating anybody, and he said he had no idea. And she she had mentioned to my cousin while I wasn't around that oh I find I found some uh, lingerie, and I you know unless he's a cross dresser, and they all kind of like laughed, even though my cousin kind of knew. Uh, he did know. There's no kind of about it. This last time I had my pink sweater dress in there. I recently made it. I uh, made for. Uh, I re recently wore it for a video, and there wasn't any stains that I remember on this dress because of, you know, my self facial videos and whatnot. But because I put makeup on and the turtleneck on some of these things rides up really high, I get smudges on it, and I just don't want to put it. Uh, you know, back in my little dresser drawer or whatever. So it was, it was dried and folded without any questions. The it was a few days later that uh, I had I was making another video. Okay, and whenever I work on the podcast or whenever I make a video, I always put my phone on airplane mode, and. Uh, you know, I had I just wasn't paying attention, and I was in no rush this particular day, so my phone was on airplane mode for like five hours or something like that because well, I didn't even uh, work on the podcast in this day. It was just strictly making a video. All I was doing was editing, and I had forgot that it was on airplane mode. But anyways, I turned my phone back on. There was you know messages from you know random friends and notifications on whatever the fuck app, and I I had a voicemail from her. And she's like, oh, call me back. I did, and uh, I was like, hey, what's going on? I just turned my phone back on. I had it on airplane mode. I was busy doing stuff. And she's like, oh, doing stuff? I was like, yeah, you don't. And she's like, uh, what are you? What were you doing? And I was like, you don't even want to know. And she's like, I don't even want to know, huh? And I was like, anyways, and she just started laughing. So I don't, you know, I, I have to say with having this podcast talking about cross-dressing and trying to encourage people to come out if they feel comfortable as long as it's not going to greatly affect their life whether that be uh family friends uh, loved ones kids uh, your work life whatever i feel like i'm very much approaching that point to where i i really need to start telling um more of the people that are staples in my life and it's not I want to be clear, it's not embarrassment that I avoid saying anything to anybody. It's really not. I'm not embarrassed. I, I like myself, whether it's in guy form or whether I'm dressed up or whether I am fully transitioned or whatever the thing is. I don't feel silly about it, okay? But I, there is a particular, uh, I guess, phrase in my head that's been creeping up, and it's, you know, walk the walk, talk the talk. I feel like I need to start walking the walk because you know talking is easy and talking is cheap and there's not much to a certain to to a certain degree there's really not much risk in you know me having this podcast or being on these these weird porn sites just down in some dungeon hole or something like that it's really it's uh it's really not that bad and you you know i think you would be surprised how many people are terrified to even say what state they live in or what their fucking first name is or like everybody just assumes like the FBI is listening or uh like somebody's just out to get you <laughs> it's just not the case really um i mean who knows there there could be some uh there could be some grand master scheme in somebody's life of assuming they're a, a double agent or they're a politician or whatever but uh yeah, I'm not. I'm not any of that. I I really don't have uh, any secrets to hide other, other than this. And you know, when you have a podcast and you make porn that you put on the internet, and I clearly show my face and like my on my Instagram and my TikToks and everything. So it's, it's it's out there. But as we all know, if you have a Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and fucking so on and so forth, if. Uh, Sometimes if you don't have your thing to be synced to your contacts, like whatever app you're using, or you're not something popular that somebody might seek out, most of the time people aren't going to randomly come across a cross-dressing trans, male to female, girl, boy, whatever the hell, out of the, the billions of people that are on the planet. But anyways, um, so I, uh, I've been having more thoughts 
and maybe just uh, purposely slipping up with the laundry to a certain point to where maybe she has to uh, engage in a conversation. For whatever reason, I just feel like it would be too, too kind of, uh, I don't know, there's, some, there's something yucky if I, if I just like come out of the blue and talk about my sexuality in terms of being a cross-dresser. Because, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't really know the right way to go about it, necessarily. Um, that's the only thing that keeps popping in my mind, though, if I'm being honest, is uh, wait for a certain thing to, to come up in conversation or something like that. I have no idea. What One of the things that I almost did shortly after this conversation um, was, like, send her a text or something like that as cowardly as it is and just be like hey do you want to see what i was up to this weekend and not show her anything explicit but kind of like uh hey this it, you know it would clearly be a picture of me dressed up or whatever and then just see what she fucking sends back or whatever but i feel like the the best thing to do would be to uh, have a conversation in person about it but i yeah i don't know so i'll i'll give you feedback on that as soon as it happens i feel like a lot of people would uh, definitely get something out of that and if i if i do it's definitely going to be more than an update it's probably going to be a whole podcast episode um anyways i have more stuff to talk about we didn't even get started and we're like fucking what 15 minutes in anyways okay um been hitting the gym really hard i i want to talk about that real quick uh 30 seconds just for the simple fact that you know, because I I am trying to reshape my body and I'm not trying to gain mass, I've been eating just a little bit less, working out much more. I've been trying to pay attention to my strength training and um, do more toning than anything else. It's, it's really hard, though, when you're trying to keep fat in certain areas when you're not on any type of hormones and then lose fat in others. So really all you can do is... Uh, try to find your best shape and then and then maybe deal with plastic surgery or something like that. I know that sounds like a really fucking lame thing to do, but when you're facing genetics and whatnot, um, your your ability to look feminine or more feminine or even extreme uh, feminine is uh, very limited. So uh, I've been going real light with the shoulders, with the chest, with the back workout, but the legs I've been going much harder in been getting a little bit thicker but the thing that actually made me really happy is my lower back pain uh has been going away when i steadily uh do my legs just once a week i go really hard though for about an hour and a half two hours and also i had uh light well, i will say minor pain in both of my knees initially starting workouts uh you know this year and, e and then even um last year and it's almost non-existent now and i uh been really paying attention to how i uh how i do everything and i do everything in the weight that i can actually handle and it's been going uh it's been going really well next thing up i bought recently actually yesterday i bought more lights for my bedroom so hopefully i can get more information to you all with uh with how much you can write off with your only fans when you make money uh last year I made $988, so I'm not sure to what extent I'm going to be able to write stuff off, but I looked at all the math, and it was over $3,000 with all the stuff that I spent in clothing, makeup, and then lighting, and then just storage stuff like hangers, and uh, and all this other stuff, the wigs, and the uh, the foam, the wig uh, foam head thingies, so I, I desperately hope that I get uh, a pretty good return on that because if I don't that's going to kind of suck or I just need to do better with my only fans I didn't I honestly didn't think though that I would make that much money because on the whole time that I've had this apartment so we're approaching two years I think or no we hit I think we hit two years um on on Pornhub the entire time that I had that uh that I've been a part of the model payment program i have like 75 or 77 dollars or something like that and with a year on only fans i had just just under a grand so i i was kind of expecting my numbers to be similar to be honest with you but it's not ad revenue i they take 20 percent of whatever i make the uh the price tag for all my stuff and it's been 
it's been pretty good. I can't really complain. Also, since we're talking about it, with the OnlyFans content, I've been getting really good feedback from people that have been enjoying my videos. And one of the things that I find to be surprising more than anything else is uh, the the two things that I get requested the most is um, more of me actually talking rather than just 100% a wash over with the music. And then obviously just watching me doing stuff like it's a music video or something. And um, sweater dresses. People just have been really enjoying that. And I uh, I didn't expect that to be the thing. Now, you know, granted, people do enjoy uh, watching me ride toys and, you know, do self-facials. And, you know, I've been uh, having people every once in a while, not, not all that common, but I do have people asking me if I can um, – Maybe have uh, maybe have a guy join with me or do porn with somebody else. And while I won't mind uh, doing that per se, there's a very limited amount of people in my life that I actually trust with doing that stuff. So that's why I take it super slow in that regard. That's why I don't want to rush anything. And even with some of my friends that I do have that are considering making porn or, or on the precipice of a, just about to jump over and start posting uh, prints or pics or whatever have you, I don't want to make any any relationship uh, weird or uh, awkward or anything like that. I've reached out to uh, one of my friends, and she just she's just not really there yet with it. And I was going to talk to another one, my uh, one of my friends that I have on my Instagram. She was talking about maybe getting some better uh, tips on how to do pictures and whatnot. And I take my stuff really serious in, in the way that I spend like a lot of time editing everything, whether that be pictures or uh, videos. And she sent me a picture, and she was like, hey, I think I need help. And it was – um, she took like a picture from behind into a mirror or whatever, and it, the picture sucked. She doesn't, but the picture was very like lackluster and just very plain Jane and whatever. But I know I go into the extremes with uh, – with everything that I wear and my look and the fake tits and the lighting, uh, especially when you add in the intense black that I have in most of my videos and pictures and whatnot. But, um, yeah. Oh, let me turn off these notifications here. Do, 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 do. Yeah, I don't know how to discontinue the uh, or stop the collaboration with my phone and my computer when I have it on airplane mode because whenever I get a message or an email, my phone doesn't get any of it. But my computer's sitting right there, and I always use that as reference, and uh, I'm sure you can hear the dinging in the back. And I don't think it's that distracting, but who knows. Um, last thing before we get into the uh, inspirations, I had somebody reach out. I'm not going to share their name, but I thought the message was really nice. And uh, it just seems like this person has uh, a similar story to, to mine and some of the other people that have reached out. And do keep in mind, there are some people that that reach out. Um, sometimes the, the message is so brief or the comment is so brief, it's not necessarily uh, worth mentioning. I, I don't mean uh, to, for that to sound like lazy or... Um, very like disregarding or anything like that but they're just like oh hey i'm kind of or whatever blah 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 it's you know it's uh anyways so this person i is from um fet life and they say hi synthetic i have listened to your first three episodes of your podcast and i'm really enjoying it i like how honest and open you are and down to earth really great i can't wait to hear more what goes on from here or i'm sorry i can't wait to hear where it goes from here I recently transi transitioned out of a long-term relationship and I have been slowly returning or return slowly opening the door to this part of my life again and your podcast is helping me with that for sure. That's awesome. I agree with you uh, when you were saying that the end of the episode 3 about how cross-dressing is glossed over, which it is. I have noticed that if you do a simple Google search for cross-dressing, Google just automatically converts it to transgender. And the resources for transgender stuff doesn't really seem to like it speaks to the cross dressing specifically. Take care and thanks again for making the podcast. So that that's awesome. I uh, there's always a part of me, and I don't know if this is just out of habit, but whenever I get 
um, any emails or messages. The first thing that I want to say is I'm always surprised how many people there are. But if you were to just go online and look at porn or have a FetLife account or Twitter or uh, Instagram or whatever, uh, we're all over the place. So I don't know if I, it has just to be out of habit that I just want to say these things without really thinking about it first. It seems like it's just my, my go-to phrase. Like, oh, I'm surprised, you know, there's so many, like, you know, I started the podcast because I know there's a lot of us out there. So why do I keep saying it? <laughs> I don't know. I'm a weirdo. You hear me slurping on a sugar-free Red Bull, per usual. Good news is I've been cutting back. I've been under 700 milligrams for about, I don't know, five days or something like that. Maybe a little bit more than that. Maybe seven days. And um, no severe negative side effects other than sometimes waking up or trying to go to sleep with a shitty headache. So I, uh, I don't think I'm going to die anytime soon. Now, we finally made it to the uh, meat and potatoes of the episode. So as I mentioned before, episodes 12 and 13, I talked in great length about who inspired me, what they did, and kind of how I implemented everything. And I mentioned people such as Marilyn Manson. And I, uh, I mentioned with Marilyn Manson and Rob Zombie with how tactile their music is to me how it makes me feel and whenever I listen to their music or watch their um, live performances on stage or even watch their music videos, how automatically sometimes a movie starts playing in my head with um, maybe me when I'm dressed up or certain imagery that I get or just how sometimes they, they're able to convey an emotion or have a, um, a very strong story build out just through it being music. I also talked about Miley Cyrus and just how she expresses herself sexually. And I also mentioned her, her facial expressions and just uh, being really poppy and out there. I talked about Todd McFarlane and I, uh, I went into great detail about uh, his work on Spawn, his heavy use of black. I talked about him working on Spider-Man. And uh, what was it? It was a, I talked about, I think it was like three or four different things. Um, foreground, midground, and background. I talked about uh, uh, perspective and um, just different angles and stuff like that. And if you look at a lot of my pictures and a lot of the stuff I do, I'm always, always changing it up and i think i might have mentioned this during the podcast uh during either episode 12 or 13 but it's in my head now so if i didn't i'm gonna say it real quick i seen some i think it was a small documentary on uh ren and stimpy and i think it was the creator or one of the uh lead animators or something like that it was called a thousand faces of ren and stimpy and they tried to press upon all the animators that whenever you're doing something, try to never use the same facial expression, uh, the, like more uh, more than once. It was always try to have something different. Now, what I took away from that, and not then, not when I, not when I watched it, but many years later, as I started making porn and taking you know sexy selfies and all this other stuff. All my. I do have some go-to positions in terms of it just turns people on to look at whether I have the fake tits in or not, uh, whether it's a certain wig or heels or whatever. There are just certain positions that people just like to see, and I would like to see those from other people as well, whether it's straight porn, gay porn, or trans, or, or whatever. There's just certain things that just look good, and the way I feel about certain positions is uh, whether it's like a head-on, above or below three-quarters, or just the rear shot of somebody's ass, whether they're bent over or standing up. If you're if you're already dressed up, what does it hurt to spend a couple seconds to take several pictures from that that angle or position and uh, just figure out if you want to use them or not? So some things just look good no matter what. That's just how I feel about it. Um, but yeah, they were talking about never use the same thing twice. So if you look at my stuff, it's always from some weird angle position, even forced perspective. Sometimes some of these pictures are so up close to my face 
and you get to see the rest of my body in the background as I, you know, as the picture goes in the distance, or it's really up close to my heel, or it's right below my tits, or something like that. That's that's what I got from that uh, Ren and Stimpy, uh, a thousand faces of Ren and Stimpy. I talked about Lady Gaga, her fashion sense, her um, on style or on style on stage presence. I uh, I mentioned that she looks like um, if you were to throw in a pink uh, or what was it? What did I say? I think I said if you were to throw hot pink lip gloss, a pair of ten inch heels. And something else into a blender. You get oh, an exclamation point! You get Lady Gaga, with my, with a lot of the stuff that I wear, and with a with a lot of the stuff that I put together for my outfits or whatever. I try to make it look like a statement, like like a sign or a or a button that needs to get pushed. Like it's it's indefinite. Like it's going to happen. It's it's really intense, and that's something that I got from Lady Gaga. Uh, I talked about Ramstein. And Lords of Acid, with both of their, um, both of their uh, music styles being very sexual. Now, obviously, they have completely different genres of music. Like Lords of Acid is techno, electronic dance, and then Ramstein is just, uh, I guess, hardcore rock. I, I don't really know specifically what it would be, but I went into great detail with them. I talked about Lisa Lawrence and how uh, I started from the very beginning with her. The first time I ever seen her face, and I I was on my the girl I was dating at the time I was on her computer, and I just kept looking for Lisa Lawrence just because I loved her face. And then when then when I found her porn, I was like, she's so feminine, but she has a cock, and I just loved her face and her lips and her voice and her hair, and she always wore a certain uh, style of uh, either black or red high heels. It was always those two very basic stiletto heels. It wasn't anything crazy like I wear. Like uh, I think they were either a four i think they were a four inch heel or something like that nothing crazy but i talked about my love for her and then i talked about in great length about sylvia boots i think uh, sylvia boots i think i gave her like three pages or something like that i just kept rambling on and on like a maniac uh with sylvia boots much like lisa lawrence and a bunch of other uh, trans performers that i discussed i always make it a point and again, because this this podcast is about my cross dressing experience and how I feel about it, sexual or, or artistically or emotionally, I always go in detail about how people start off in their career uh, with making porn. Now, I don't, I don't keep bringing up porn to sound obsessive about it, but it, because it has the impact that it does on the human psyche, and you know, obviously, we all watch uh, different porn for different reasons, and I'm I'm sure most of the people listening. You've watched a good fair amount of hypno porn, um, BBC cuckold stuff, or um, that uh, what's that stuff? Uh, Queen of Spades. You see, I can't. I'm I'm sure many of you have seen those Queen of Spades tattoos on some crossdresser or trans woman's ass. You know, I'm sure you've watched a bunch of hypno videos with uh, the popper stuff and like the little beats at the bottom of the video. I I know we've all had our share in that. But while watching that. I'm sure with some of us, and especially for those of us that are older, sometimes you come across people earlier in their career when they're just getting started. Sometimes it's on She Male Strokers, where I, I had talked about Mia Isabella. When you look at her first stuff, it's seriously, and I'm not, I, I said it, I said this when I was talking about her then, and I'm going to say it now. When she first got started on She Male Strokers, she looks nothing like she does now, and she looked like a dude kind of wearing a wig. She had, she was not on hormones. She she didn't have her tits done or her ass done. She was a fucking string bean. She was super skinny. And then, you know, 10 or 15 years later, you're just like, dude, what in the fuck? Now, if you were to give my honest opinion of somebody that has, like, their whole look together from top to bottom, I think she's fucking, like, she has to be, like, number one in terms of uh, just looking clean and professional and just... On all points, whether it's you're talking about facial surgeries or her tits, or maybe getting lipo done with a Brazilian butt lift or uh, injections into her, all of it, all of it is amazing. And with Sylvia Boots, and you look at her earlier in her career as she would progress forward, everybody, because they really care about it, because that's that's how we look, you know, you know, when we're talking about us being cross dressers or in the early stage stages of transition. 
you want to look that way for a reason. If you if you didn't, you wouldn't spend all this time and money listening to me fucking ramble on about cross dressing. You wouldn't spend all this time jerking off wearing women's clothing. Clearly, it means something to us. And you know, with the trans performers, Sylvia Boots, she's going to be the last one I I mentioned before I go on to this. <laughs> my inspirations, I still haven't even really started with it. Uh, it's an awesome thing to see. When you when you see somebody when they've had like no facial surgery, if you look at Sylvia Booth's um, or or any of these people that I mentioned before, Lisa Lawrence or uh, Mia Isabella or Danny Daniels, when they don't get facial surgery and they haven't started hormones and they haven't gotten their uh, their tits or their biggest pair of tits, because um, there's some performers, trans or not, or just regular women, they just get bigger and bigger and bigger tits and. Uh, they just everybody has their own mile markers, you know. But it's uh, yeah, she she definitely inspired me with that very short career. But as I as I mentioned before, she she's in prison for killing people. Well, one per, one person in particular, I guess. But anyways, let's let's just finally get on <laughs> with the episode. So the first one that I oh before okay before I get started, I should have already said this third installment is not going to be my last because um i i do constantly come across stuff whether it's performers people's places or things or music or whatever i do come across things consistently where i'm like oh this is awesome i like this person's whatever you know the first two episodes were were very much cemented my mentality with a certain style or a way to approach things from the get-go, whether it had anything to do with cross-dressing or not. With the things on this list, either I caught them much later in life, most of the things, or once I really started making content, which is really only in the past, what, four years, and i really trying to make it good in the last two, I really didn't start to implement a lot of the stuff that I was getting from the things that, I, that I'm about to talk about until recently. So the reason that some of the stuff wasn't on the last version or the last episode of the inspirations was because I was like, ah, this is, you know, this is kind of on the outskirts of the stuff that really inspired me. But then at the end, end of the day, I really looked at everything and I was like, well, I fucking got this from this and I got this from this and I appreciate this from that. So now when I'm making stuff, I have all these different things that I'm thinking about. And if they just don't, uh, if they don't hack it, you know, I, I try to redo it or, uh, or I just fucking burn it completely. So anyways, first thing on the list, Rocky Horror Picture Show. It's a, <laughs> it's a musical horror that came out in 1975. It's starring Tim Curry, Tim Curry as Frankenfurter, Susan Sarandon as Janet Weiss, Barry Bostwick as Brad Majors, Richard O'Brien as Riff Raff, Nell Campbell as Columbia, Patricia Quinn as Magenta, and Meatloaf as Eddie. One of the things that always fucking pissed me off, and I never, I never looked this up. Maybe I'll do this one day, but um, Columbia, Nell Campbell as Columbia, actually has magenta hair, and Patricia Quinn has long brown curly hair. And why they didn't have different names or like, like swap them is is beyond me. It it, uh, it really drove me nuts for all these years, and I'm just mentioning it now without even uh, stopping the podcast and trying to look that up and maybe tell you. I don't know. Maybe I'll do it one of these days, but it always seemed really fucking silly to me. So this movie is about a newly married couple that gets stranded during the rain. Um, they're seeking shelter. I think they had like a flat tire or something like that. And they find themselves at the castle of Dr. Frankenfurter, a cross-dressing scientist and inventor. It turns into a big mess. With everybody, you know, kind of fucking around with everybody else, and the doctor creates um, some, like, perfect man or something like that, and then this man, along with everybody else, is just kind of wandering the castle, just trying to figure everything out. But basically, the doctor and company, uh, they're from Planet Transylvania, and it's a fun build-up of characters with music to match. It's just a bunch of silliness. And uh, basically, basically, by the end of the movie, everything gets out of hand with uh, Dr. Frankenfurter just kind of like losing his mind. And then eventually getting killed. Uh, the whole time I, I was watching this, I 
couldn't really get a grasp. I was 11 at the time. No, I th- I might have been a little bit older. I do remember seeing this for the first time. It was on VH1. It was during the day, I believe. I was at my grandma's house. I was waiting for my parents to pick me up. I, as I mentioned before, for whatever reason, when I was in elementary school or middle school, I went to a different uh, school district than I lived in with my mom and dad uh, in Mount Clemens at night. I don't I don't know why that was ever the case, but um, yeah. So I was always just watching TV, waiting for somebody to pick me up, and they would usually pick me up around four thirty five, five thirty, something like that. <clears throat> And I, I remember sitting in the front den of my grandma's house, watching this movie, just thinking, like, what the fuck? I was surprised at all the uh, sex, all the pervertedness that was on TV. Because back then, a lot of crazy stuff really couldn't come on until, I don't know, like, after midnight or something like that. Uh, this movie was really enchanting. Now, when there wasn't the music playing, there was always weird sound effects and ambient tones and quirky dialogue the the campiness is what kind of caught me off guard though i i didn't know what camp was or what campiness was with movies or anything else until in my late 20s or something like that with you know when you see episodes of like the original batman that was on tv and it's just referred to as campy because that's what it is it's really uh silly and goofy but that was kind of keeping my attention with how weird it was until the I seen the doctor, uh, Frankenfurter, which was Tim Curry, uh, cross-dressed. And then I kind of became sexually confused. And here I am at my grandma's house watching this crazy stuff. And occasionally she would walk through and just like, ugh, what, what, are you, what the hell are you watching? That queer shit. And I was just like, I, I didn't get why some people were angry at some stuff. Even now, I, I'm always really confused when... A straight person or uh, a religious person or just an older person that um, they're like overly conservative even though I'm sure everybody in their you know late teens and early 20s and maybe even early 30s just acts like a fucking nut job and it's not really until later in life you, you kind of calm down with anything anyways but anyway so I I'm watching this stuff and it it wasn't until I seen the Tim Curry's character, Dr. Frankenfurter, that I connected it to my dad's titty mags. I talked on previous episodes about uh, looking at titty mags, looking at the back of the magazines where all the small advertisements were, and sometimes I would see a chick with a dick, and it would say she-male or tranny or something like that. And now my wheels are, are kind of spinning. With the, uh, with the stuff that Tim Curry wears in the movie, it's fishnet, heels, makeup, a strong black curly wig... And I immediately started thinking about me and my activities. When, you know, Again, this is me in middle school. I wasn't in high school watching this stuff. And in my middle school years, it was when I started cross-dressing and when I lived in the trailer park. And I kind of came away after watching this movie. And, it, and it's really weird that I guess I would have this kind of casual sense, this feeling. But I, the biggest thing I kind of came away with the after watching this movie, was that it's it's okay to indulge my cross-dressing. I'm watching this this movie just being broadcast, and the, the biggest thing that I came away, emotionally, now this has nothing to do with like any artistic uh, stuff or whatever, but the, the sense that all these characters were walking around and it really wasn't a big deal in the movie... But I, I do remember sometimes feeling weirded out when I would cross dress when I was, you know, go back to the trailer park on the weekend when sometimes people would be gone and I would just, you know, go outside, do my sexy walk and just start jerking off and masturbating and getting those, getting that, you know, rush of adrenaline and, uh, you know, that high that some of us are seeking, um, some more than others. But I, I remember watching this and just being like, oh, I could just. It's okay to to you know dip into it a little bit more. It's it's okay to indulge, have another taste. Um, now I will say, the campiness of it. The 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 first thing that comes to mind when you watch a movie like this and you make content like I do, is it's okay to be silly. It's okay to be cartoony or campy or funny. It doesn't always have to be serious in terms of cross dressing and, and making content. Now I will say. 
that while I don't want to be a, a punching bag for anything, and I don't, I don't hate drag. I'm glad, you know, you know, uh, drag, um, drag queens do exist, or drag kings for that matter. I, I feel like the reason a lot of people accept it, and this is just me being very ignorant or whatever, but I think the reason a lot of people accept it is because they're like, oh, look at that funny thing, look at that queer dressing up like a woman, and I don't feel like most people in the straight community or vanilla community and I, I say vanilla community in the sexual terms of us crossdressers or trans or whatever um people if if people can laugh at it they're not so they're not they're not so threatened by it and that's kind of the the original hang up I had with um drag queens or just I guess drag in in its entirety and I feel like also cross dressing is kind of like the the next step down for other people when they're like looking at stuff because when things become sexual that's when that's when people are just like ugh but when things are cartoony or silly or meant to be fun cuz like how many how many movies or TV shows you've seen when somebody's uh like there's a man dressed up as a woman and it's funny and it's silly and it's hilarious and whatever and it's something to be just a fucking joke uh, and then it's then it's not alarming and it, it doesn't seem like a weapon to people. But then when you, I feel like with the Rocky Horror Picture Show, it kind of blurs that line a little bit. It kind of makes that gray area a little bit wider. And I, I feel like it opened up some space for, for people, to not just go to the movies like sometimes when this premieres and then everybody's a crossdresser, everybody's wearing the wig and the makeup and the. The dark eyeliner and uh, all, and all that other stuff, but just for the fact that like, hey, it's it's not a big deal. I also got with this that uh, maybe I take my intentions too seriously. Maybe I'm trying to be a little bit too serious with um, like I I don't know if I come off this way on the podcast or not, but sometimes when I have my personal thoughts. And I'm I'm going through uh, Instagram and I'm looking at all these um, drag queens, uh, just doing like silly stuff and people like laughing at the background. Sometimes I'm like, are we just the butt of the? And I say we as like uh, the broader community of people of men or trans people that wear women's clothing or you know kind of they're looking like what they would like to look in the future or you know when you have spare time if you don't plan to transition. Um, are we just the butt of the joke? Are we just uh, some silly thing that nobody takes serious? But uh, you know, I got over that, and I was just like, you know, you're gonna do what you're gonna do, and if and if that's the way that you know you can kind of get into the world without alarming anybody or freaking anybody out, it's not such a bad thing, especially now that it's on like primetime TV. So, from a production standpoint, it, you'd be a little bit more loose, be a little bit campy. And I, now, I haven't made any of these videos necessarily. I do have stuff on my docket of videos to make that I it, I, I really do want to be kind of over the top and fucking nuts. I have, I don't know, I think something like 50 or 60 videos that I wrote details out for, like what the video is going to be called, the music that's going to be played, what I'm going to wear, and, and all this other stuff. Um, I can only do so much, though, when I have a full-time job and I have the weekend, so... But this kind of inspired me to, when I was younger, to, to cross-dress a little bit more. Obviously, I'm doing it for different reasons than uh, necessarily what's in the, the movie. But as I got older and now, it's like, well, explore that softer, sillier side and, and try to have fun with it. Um, so, yeah, that's Rocky Horror Picture Show. The next thing up, uh, the next three things are all kind of put together with like the same reasons. But... Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, music a little bit with these. So, Goodfellas and Casino are directed, and the screenplay is by Martin Scorsese. Now, you've, uh, I'm sure you've heard of him and his other films like, uh, what, Taxi? Is it Taxi or Taxi Driver? Let's see here. Do, 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 do. And, um, what was it, Gangs in New York? Um, those movies are amazing and uh they they didn't re taxi driver 1976 they didn't make uh the list for the reasons that i'm about to talk about just because they didn't inspire me in that way and i don't think that they were necessarily 
uh, used in that way either, which is why I'm not going to talk about them in great detail. But both of these movies have a great use of character development. These movies put characters into situations where you uh, see them succeed or fail, uh, or fail. They become very rich with development very quickly in the length of the movie. Even if the movie's like two hours long, with some of the richness of the of the script, I feel like some some Netflix series would have to have multiple episodes spanning multiple hours to kind of give you that same information. And with the thing I like about Martin Scorsese, or even Kevin Smith, or also uh, Quentin Tarantino, is I feel like by the end of almost all their movies, you can just put the character in your head and put them in your own situations that you would like to create for them. And you could kind of find how the character would react with things. That's what I like about these two movies in particular. You don't spend a lot of time in total, in real time, you're not spending 12 hours with these people. These movies are no more than three hours. I think Casino, when it came out, it was a multiple VHS box set that you, that you just got as one thing. So I, I think it was like three hours and change or something like that. Really good. Um, even at, at a young age, I appreciated the dialogue, no matter how bland or average. It was very realistic, and more often than not, it was super intense, filled with expletives and just insanity, especially with um, Joe Pesci's character's. Joe, Joe Pesci in almost all of Martin Scorsese's movies is just over-the-top violent and somebody that just has no self-control whatsoever. And he's he's one of those characters that I, um, I would give as a prime example <clears throat> of watching the character start from one end of the spectrum of maybe being successful and having uh, some reasonable amount of humanity... And then by the time you get to the end of the movie or the episode, or um, get to the end of the movie, you get to see the character completely fall apart, and there's just there's just nothing left. They they just lost themselves due to drugs or violence or whatever have you. But um, so the situations that the characters are put in are all aided with either voiceover ex- explaining things like with an exposition with an exposition. And the music is perfect. Uh, you get a great amount of detail with with a lot of these two films in particular. Now there are there there are other films besides you know Martin Scorsese's films that do it. But the thing I, that I noticed that he does in particular is while somebody's speaking with a voiceover and you hear music, there's a lot of tracking shots that just fill in a lot of this empty space that would normally be had. And I love it, personally. I love a good voiceover from a Martin Scorsese film. And I love those tracking shots where you're just watching you know, the crowd or taxis go by or something like that. But you know what? Almost all... I can't think of anything off the top of my head that doesn't. But all the movies that I'm thinking of with uh, with Martin Scorsese, they all there's voiceovers in like every single movie. I don't know. I might look into that later and see which ones don't. I think I've seen... I think I've seen all of his films, though. Um, so specifically with both of these movies, they exhibit, uh, very strong scenes with drug use, violence, and sex that is just unforgettable. The scenes where, uh, certain people snort coke and they pull their head up quick or they're indulging in some extreme, uh, sex or, or drug-induced paranoia. It's all very intriguing and just pulls you in. The music, the music usually has already started, or it's about to soon start. Um, you know, with the scene, if it's it's if it's one of those scenes where it's kind of built into like a, a a roller coaster type of setup, to where you, it's just a a really quick pickup. So, with the exception of anticipation or the soon to be violence, music was always present or within reach for both of these movies. Um, the quiet parts were almost always stuck out because you knew something was uh, not right in terms of something was like a little bit off with the character or something was very wrong. Now, with both of these movies, there are more... Now, if you talk with people that are movie buffs or people that really enjoy certain scenes of movies, you can kind of have this conversation. There is a helicopter scene... <laughs> 
a helicopter scene with uh, in Goodfellas, one of the main characters. He is uh, he's been slowly just going down this rabbit hole of doing more and more coke over time, over over months and years. You see all these characters unravel in Goodfellas. The three main characters just lose themselves. But with this helicopter scene, um, Henry is uh, he's doing more and more coke, and he starts to just get super paranoid, and he's constantly looking out his blinds. And it's there's several times in in this movie where they do a close up shot of uh, what is it? I always want to say fucking Ray Loyetta. I always want to say Henry Cavill. I'm such a fucking asshole. Um. Henry, the the character's name, where they do a close up shot of him and he's snorting coke and he pulls his head up quick and his eyes are bloodshot and then sometimes the music kicks in and then the momentum with the music just keeps playing and playing and playing and playing and then you're you're just watching like looking out of car windows and looking out of his blinds and talking with people and people are on the phone listening and it's this mantic it's it's this manic energy that I just I I love from this film, and it's not the only it's not the only scene where uh, a character is um, has momentum building. There's other parts with like Joe Pesci, and then other parts in the movie where there's like uh, a large amount of violence or things are happening quickly, especially early in the film with the way they portray everything. Everything's very fun and nonchalant, and you can just do whatever the fuck you want, and nobody's nobody's addicted to drugs yet. Nobody's doing anything behind um anybody anybody's back one of the maid guys his name is Polly they in the in the earlier parts of the movie they're doing everything to you know please Polly Polly isn't like the big part of the movie it's it's all about Henry Henry Hill and him falling apart and Henry Hill was a real person i think he died like 10 years ago or something like that but uh he was a real person and he did all this crazy shit um, I know the other two guys were real, but apparently uh, Joe Pesci's character, I guess he was actually uh, crazier in real life, so it was actually toned down in the movie with just how nuts he was, if that, uh, if that tells you anything. But sticking with what I was talking about with the music and the momentum, you get swept up almost like a heavy current in a river with some of these characters, and this music is playing, and you're just kind of like, yeah, fucking A, fucking A, and then you find yourself similar with House of a Thousand Corpses or Devil's Rejects, you're kind of rooting for the good guys with all this with all this crazy stuff going on, and they're doing these horrible things, but because this music is kind of like fun and you're getting into it and you're like, fuck yeah, uh, you kind of, I, f- I feel like you kind of get lost with the characters. And, and, you know, sometimes a movie ends and I'm just like, I think to myself, I, I'm just like, damn, dude, I was really kind of just... Uh, I was really kind of rooting for, <laughs> for these characters. Now, with Casino, for whatever reason, I can never remember any of the characters' names in Casino, except for the actors. But Robert De Niro eventually uh, wipes up one of the characters, Sharon Stone. Again, I can't remember the characters' names. She completely loses her goddamn mind. Her character does throughout the movie. And this movie's like three hours long. It has to be. It has to be like three hours and change. Um, and the music that they choose is just so awesome. Now, both of the, uh, the soundtracks for this movie match the time that they were in. Now, I believe, uh, I think Goodfellas, they start all the way from like the early sixties into the, into like the late seventies and very early eighties. But, uh, from what I can remember with Casino, most of the music is very much from the seventies. Now, it's it's several genres that they use, but with the uh, with the violence and the drug use, everything in Casino is is much more intense compared to Goodfellas. Now you have many more characters in Casino. You have you have many more moving balls. Um, with Sharon Stone's character, the the stuff that she does. You know, behind the back of uh, Robert De Niro's character, you know, when she's like cheating on him, or she's uh, she's like doing drugs, or, ev- or eventually overdoses. If you ever want to watch these movies and see what I'm talking about, when they when they just have a certain soundtrack on, and it's just playing as all these characters are doing whatever they're doing, I get swept up in it. I'm like, dude, this is fucking awesome. 
And especially now because I, I and I'm not saying I'm Martin Scorsese for cross dressers, okay? I'm not saying that. But when I when I'm putting stuff together, every time I I'm making something, I put much more effort into every single video. Now, I I, I have said before and I'll say it again since we're talking about it. With some of my smaller videos, you know, I, I don't spend six hours on something that maybe took me 10 or 15 minutes to make. I spend, you know, maybe 45 minutes on something that I spent uh, a half an hour, you know, making. And obviously, the longer the video, the more editing I do and whatever. But it's that passion that I have for uh, cutting everything together and just doing all of the stuff I do. But with these two movies, you can, uh, the, the thing that I took away from these two movies is um, you can see that you can control the speed and momentum of the film with sound. And you can use music to intensify the desired feeling being expressed. That's what I got from both of these movies. Boogie Nights. This entire movie is wrapped up in a soundtrack of the disco era. It's, uh, it's pretty intense. Uh, 1997. I looked it up just to kind of get a, a couple more facts about it. It's, a, it's considered a drama. But if you watch the movie, it's more of a comedy than anything else. From beginning to end, there's only one scene that I can think of off the top of my head. Which I was just like, oh, that kind of sucks. Only one. The rest of the movie, uh, it's it's ridiculous. So anyways, a movie. it's a movie about the porn industry that takes place in the late 70s. It's uh, starring Mark Wahlberg as Dirk Diggler. Julianne Moore as Amber, Burt Reynolds as Jack Horner, Heather Graham as Roller Girl, William H. Macy as Little Bill, Nina Hartley as Little Bill's wife. This movie is so outrageous and cartoony it's hard to take serious. Just like the other movies I mentioned, the music really drives the story. Everything is made up to seem fun, playful, easy, romantic, and sexy. All the characters, though, Seem to be so fucking dumb and careless. The movie itself, as far as the story goes, is kind of weak. But with all the characters doing drugs, acting in porn, and slowly becoming unhinged, just like the other movies that I mentioned, it's all, uh, the, the way I feel about it, it's all pretty excusable, just for the simple fact that it's a, a mindless, fun, um, guilty pleasure. Like you, It's just really self-indulging when you watch it, because it's so... It's so over the top, and again, it's considered a drama if you look it up. I There was nothing dramatic about it other than like one scene, and it just I kind of feel like it was just kind of to give like one of the characters like a little bit of depth or whatever. But if you watch this movie, they have the same type of craziness with Goodfellas or Casino, where you know a character's like snorting coke, and then they're just out of their minds, or they're acting really hyper. And because Boogie Nights is uh, more, I guess, lighthearted or a little bit more playful. You know, sometimes with some of these characters, when they're getting high, they're just talking about dumb shit that has nothing to do with anything, like working out or starting a, a music band or a music career or something like that. And you're, you're watching this, and you're like, dude, this everybody is insane. But it's fun. It, I had a good time uh, watching it. But the reason I mention this and especially why it wasn't in my first two episodes but it really drives the point home that i'm trying to make with the music and if you're if you're anybody listening and you just want to know why i feel the way i do about certain things or if you're looking to maybe make your own content whether it's pictures or or videos like i do that's why I, I'm sharing some of these details, and I want to give you multiple examples of everything. In the first two episodes, episodes uh, 12 and 13, I, I mention uh, different artists, whether it be um, pencil artists or musical artists or uh, multiple porn stars. I like, to, and for one, it's just true. With all the stuff that I'm bringing up, I actually feel this way about these things that I'm talking about. It's not like these people are giving me ad revenue or something like that with with sharing certain things this is all this is all passion and whether it's uh you know more silly or, or lighthearted, just like this fucking boogie nights movie i'm talking about in one way or another 
it inspired me or in the past or even now i i maybe have a little bit more weight on certain subjects like with the music and if you watch my um my most recent videos probably i i would go to far say as far as my last 10 maybe 15 videos that have had a strong amount of music in them i i've been getting more and more um careful with how i cut my music and with how i cut my scenes because i splice everything together uh yeah so this movie is a great example i i think it would be fun if you're listening to this with all these things that i give you as uh, as reference or stuff that i'm talking about that inspired me not I'm not saying like, hey, watch this so you can make the same type of stuff I am or, or whatever. But if you just want to know where I'm coming from, and even if you want to send me a message like, hey, I just watched that Boogie Nights movie you were talking about, I feel the exact same way. Or, or whatever, maybe I'm totally wrong and you just want to tell me to go fuck myself. Send me an email, let's talk about it. So that's how I felt about Boogie Nights. It goes, I don't want to say it was as silly as like Basketball or uh orgasmo or anything like that <laughs> it's not that silly but it's it's much closer on the spectrum to that than it is to uh goodfellas or casino the next things i'm going to mention just real quick uh cocaine cowboys which i believe they are for sale on youtube but they, there's actually i think uh i think there's a couple seasons of Cocaine Cowboys on Netflix. That's where I first started watching it. And then I, I looked up a few more things on YouTube or whatever. It has to do with Miami. It has to do with cocaine. And it has to do with... Uh, I think it's... I think it's all the 80s, if I'm not mistaken. I believe it's the 80s. But they use a lot of that Latino uh, Miami music or whatever. And... The whole time I'm watching, I'm just having a great time. I'm loving the entire thing. The movie, because um, Joe Rogan had the the guy that made Coca Cocaine Cowboy. I always I, I say those words messed up for for whatever reason. Cocaine. Um, he had the guy that made the film on his podcast, and Joe Rogan even mentioned. You know, the whole time I'm listening to this music and I'm just having a good time. And same thing with me. Another thing, and, and maybe you're seeing the theme here, but Scarface, which again has to do with Miami. And I think this has to do with just the 70s, the disco era. Just drug-fueled insanity. But the the music is a very strong character in that film. And I think you would kind of see the stuff that I'm talking about where if the if the music is used right... You can kind of um, either ride out certain scenes, go into certain scenes, or uh, weigh really heavy on something that might be uh, sad or suspenseful. It's uh, it's really intense. So let's uh, let's go on to the next one here. I I came into this next thing when I was, I believe. I was in middle school, but Nine Inch Nails, um, extremely artistic and heavily stylized. It's an industri it's industrial rock is what it's classified as. I looked up the number of members. It mostly just seems to be Trent Reznor was one of the creators of Nine Inch Nails. And from what I can tell, it was one other guy. I didn't uh, type his name down. Uh, 1988 is when they first started being active from Ohio. When I first started listening to them in middle school, it was unlike anything else I ever heard. The only other thing that I can classify in nearly that realm would be Marilyn Manson. Now, there is there is other stuff. I can't remember a lot of the bands that I'm thinking with, with their music or even the, the tracks from certain albums or whatever. It's hard for me to, to have all that shit just spitting out of my head. For whatever reason, when it comes to names, whether it's bands or albums, especially the lyrics of songs, I I just uh, just movies start playing in my head whenever I start listening to any type of music, and that and I'm just gone. So any anything, whether it's a good song or not, doesn't matter if it's rap or rock or whatever. I can't remember shit. 
Anyways, getting back to it. I, I do remember uh, when I was in middle school just really enjoying it and, j and it just seemed, seeming really dark and seedy. Now that you say it's industrial, yeah, it has like a gritty quality to it and somewhat uh, unfinished and uh, like it was uh, built from scratch in, in somebody's basement or something like that. But the albums I liked and everything I own uh, you know, music from is uh, the Downward Spiral album from 1994, White Teeth from 2005, Add Violence from 2007, Hes Hesitation from 2013, The Fragile from 1999, and Fixed from 1992. Um, the music is all by itself. Even, even knowing that it's considered industrial, I, he's so on his own, Trent Reznor. If you look up just whole albums, he, he started making albums to where they were similar to ambient music, like you would have. And mini movies as like background music or something like that. Now, if you're if you're anybody that listens to ambient music, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Most ambient music sounds like it's a uh, it's a soundtrack from some movie, whether it's whether it's uh, action or adventure or, or romance or thriller or outer space uh, film. They all almost all ambient music sounds like a soundtrack for something. Um, Let's see here. Now, I found it to be interesting and uh, inspiring because if you look at all the stuff that I just... Um, not all the stuff I just mentioned, but if you if you look at some of his music videos like Closer, it's super gritty. It has consistent hard cuts, very abrupt. It had a very tactile sense to it, similar to Marilyn Manson and Rob Zombie. It was very odd with a lot of the imagery he used. Kind of reminded me of the ring when the people would watch that VHS uh, VHS tape, and then at some point in time she would crawl out of the TV and fucking kill you. Down in it, very disorienting video, flashing colors, and seemingly random. Like there was not much stitched together. Like it was all just kind of not even thrown in a blender, but just blocks thrown on a floor is kind of how I felt about it. Head like a hole. Lots of black and white stock footage with some negatives in there. Uh, over different video and pictures. Um, Sin seems very uh, raw and very much of a product of the time, that being the 90s. Uh, gritty, broken up, strong sense of sexual imagery. And that when I come across some of this stuff as I get older, or even going back to it after I'd known it, um, it has existed all these years, now because I, I make my own little uh, porn and whatnot, I, I look at everything a lot differently. Uh, I I want to say I critique everything much more, but I, I don't say that to make it sound like I'm a stickler or an asshole or anything like that. I just look at every single thing. Now, I will say, if it's a movie, for example, regardless of what type of movie it is, I will just watch the movie to try to have a good time and not think think about anything else. Sincerely. I, I do that with almost anything. But if I if I liked it and I watch it a second, third, and a fourth and a fifth time, I I scrutinize everything a little bit more, like, oh, the color seems to change here, but not here. What were they trying to go for? I talk about and the I talk about the Matrix one and two and Blade One and Two when um you know, sometimes they're they're above ground, it's a certain color, and when they're below ground, they use uh, more earthly colors, and sometimes, you know, when they're in the matrix, they use more natural colors, and uh, aren't they use more, um, like, those blues and greens, and then when they're out of the matrix, they use more earthly tones or more muted colors. It's, uh, it's all, it's all fun, and the more that you watch something, you, you tend to pick stuff out. Now, not all movies are like that, not all movies have the same value of, of just being interesting, or, or depth. I would definitely say that, in my experience, that's not the case with most movies. Now, some filmmakers, uh, maybe like Robert Rodriguez or Quentin Tarantino or Kevin Smith um, or uh, Martin Scorsese, you know, they they do get more and more involved with stuff that might be in, in the background or uh, what do you call those things? Uh, Easter eggs. 
um, depth of, of colors. Like sometimes in certain scenes, some people have us uh, movies, and maybe it's just like a one-off. But every time this is about to happen or this does happen, there's this color object on the background, or the, a color shift might happen in a in a certain scene scenario or something like that. Now you see, you see some obvious stuff in certain um, in certain movies when there is a, a callback to something that happened in the past. It might look dreamlike, like everything's really shimmery. And uh, everything has like a lot of white added to it, like everything's glowing. And then other times, if something happened like way back in the far past, or they make they want to use like stock footage, it's like black and white, or they use the, that old timey uh, film grain or something like that, like it's uh, taken from a camera. There's there's that stuff that's much more obvious. But then when you then when you follow like people that are a little bit more um, developed in their filmmaking, or they take more chances. You can clearly see that uh, they 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 always have like a go to thing. You know, whether it's character dialogue or it's explosions, or whatever, everybody has their own thing. But the thing I took away from Nine Inch Nails is experiment, experiment, experiment with everything. Because I made a video. I don't remember what it's uh, what it's called on my OnlyFans, but it was heavily inspired, and I used Nine Inch Nails music. And I did a lot of crazy editing that I was actually very proud of. Um, it's not a popular video on there, but the way I edited everything and all the hard cuts I did and how in beat and tune it was with the music, I I was super happy with it. I was like, dude, if I could make more like this, this would be awesome. I, I, I struggled through the editing process, but I was having fun while I was doing it. And that's and that's what I'm talking about. And if you, if you have time, whether you're... Uh, if you're a delivery driver or if you're driving alone or if you find yourself at home or whatever and you have time to Google some of those uh, videos that I mentioned for Nine Inch Nails and, and you can kind of see what I'm talking about with how specific they are, um, that's the stuff that inspires me. Next up, David Bowie. Now, if you're not a music person, he was most commonly known for outside of the music realm. Uh, for the Labyrinth movie, he played Jareth, and that was in 1986. Um, coming across his content as I got older, uh, his look and his sound was very colorful, and it was very appealing to me. Now, the the thing that I get from him, and it's hard to describe in words, but I'm just going to do my best. There's something about his personality, which you know, always, always leaked into his work, I feel, as very saturating. Did you ever, did you ever consume um, an entertainment product, whether it's a, whether you played a game or watched a movie or listened to a book on tape or music, and it hit you on multiple levels? The thing with me and David Bowie is that all, although, Artistically, it never really hit me all that hard with him. I guess emotionally, I feel almost like it's uh, nourishment whenever I, I would consume anything from David Bowie. Like I, like, I wasn't just eating bullshit like fast food or, or candy bars. Whenever I consumed anything from uh, David Bowie, and again, especially as I got older, because I, I listened to the soundtrack for the Labyrinth movie when I was younger, or if I would, uh, you know, watch the movie or whatever. And you, you just, you, you mature with with whatever you would consume as you get older and your taste might change or you, or you might have a bigger appreciation or, or, or a different perspective or something like that. But I always felt with him that I was always getting more than what was, you know, uh, being presented. Like there was always more than one thing. It was always artistically, uh, emotionally, very captivating to me that always just, I always, I remember with anything, even even now whenever I listen to anything from David Bowie or see a small clip on YouTube or whatever, I'm not, I don't find myself to be busy or fidgeting with anything else whenever I watch a music video of his or listen to his music or, or whatever. He, um, I guess you could say he makes me, he makes me happy, but, um that 
emotional nourishment I get from it. I I know that sounds really weird and it's like a really way really weird way to put it or whatever, but I I get a lot of um sati- satiation from him. But uh he was always very progressive in his interviews and always a very kind and open person, very androgynous sense of fashion and and even body type. In some of his concert performances and music videos, you get to see this. Uh, he uh, was born January 8th, 1947, and died January 10th, 2016, so he's 69 years old. I, You know, with when people like him pass, I, I get these regrets of, you know... I've, I've never been... I know this sounds fucking nuts. I've never been to a concert of any kind in my entire life. And when somebody like this passes... I have regrets. I'm like, fuck, man. You could have had such a good time. And I just never will. It, it'll never um, come back around. So maybe I'll fucking get on that one day. But uh, yeah, anyways, getting back into it. His uh, genres of music are art, rock, pop, and electronic. If you look that up, that's that's what I seen. I was like, okay, sounds good. Um, From him, and this is... Uh, whether you're just talk, whether you're just listening to his music or even watching his videos, it's very vivid and dreamlike. With him, it makes me feel like he's coloring outside of the lines, and I and I mean that in a very literal sense. When you uh, listen to the way he sings, and then even his physical presentation in his music videos, so visually or lyrically. And it always seemed like he was just doing what he wanted to do. Um, my favorite songs of his... I don't have a lot of his music, but I... Because, you know, iTunes and Apple is what it is, I really prefer that method of just owning what I want to own and nothing more. And I, I think I own over 8,000 songs now, and that takes up a lot of uh, real estate. And if I were to buy every single album off of every single song I would ever I have ever bought... I would probably have to have like two terabytes worth of information on my phone just, just for that fact. So, uh, but anyways, my favorite songs from him is uh, "Space Oddity," "Life on Mars," "China Girl," "Let's Dance," "Fame," "Fashion," "Ziggy Stardust," "Cat People," and my favorite one, which is actually one of my most recent. I actually, I think it's my last purchase from him. Uh, Black Star. <coughs> um, I don't. Similar to that artist, her name is called. Uh, she goes by Peaches. I don't know what her real name is. I hate the way she dresses. I don't know why she tries to make everything so fucking ugly. And I, I feel the same way about David Bowie. If you ever watch any of his music videos or whatever, I just don't get it. It seems like uh, Peaches and and David Bowie go out of their way to have a very unappealing look, but his style overall inspires me. It feeds me. Uh, it it nourishes me in an artistic way. And it, with what I got from him, and with what I do now in terms of taking pictures, making videos, just being a perverted crossdresser, however you want to put it, when I'm when I'm making stuff to be consumed by others, I I'm looking for things that are not obvious. Does that make sense? I'm I'm looking for things that maybe don't make sense, thinking outside of the box, coloring outside of the lines. Now, whether you mean that in the literal sense when I'm making videos or whatever, whether it's the the color of something, the speed of something, or even just like the subject matter or the context. With with David Bowie, I try to uh, expand that a little bit more. And similar with Nine Inch Nails because. You know, Nine Inch Nails is so far out of the realm of just like what the hell is going on. David Bowie is a little bit more down to earth with all of his content. He's much. He seems to be much more of a people person. Everything seems to be a much um, more warm-hearted and kind. And I'm not saying, uh, you know, with what I just said before about him and his style. Like, uh, and I I mean this with his music videos and such because I'm talking about all the artistic performances. I'm not talking about his daily daily wear or maybe what he looks like on the red carpet i have no idea i'm just talking about some of the stuff that inspired me uh whether it's going from music to my brain and creating a like some little video that just plays out 
or just hearing some of the uh, the lyrics and me just getting a feeling for it, and then maybe it doesn't translate into me making a video for OnlyFans or something like that. But um, yeah, I I fucking dig David Bowie. Okay, let's see if I can say her name correctly, because honestly, I actually have no idea how to say it. <laughs> Olivia D. Berardinas. Uh, she's an American illustration uh, pinup artist. She was born in November 1948, so she's 73. She's still alive. I actually just uh, did a little bit of um, YouTubing and Googling or whatever. I think she has a uh, interview coming up on YouTube. It asked me to uh, set a reminder or whatever, but... Um, yeah, so she's still doing a, she's still doing well, alive and kicking. She's most famous for illustrating Betty Page. Her online store, uh, eolivia.com, has prints, mini prints, puzzles, stickers, postcards, enamel pins, magnets, and books, and so on and so forth. I came across her in my early twenties, just walking through like uh, bookstores on like how to draw, and naturally, even though she's not a, a how to draw book, you you do eventually learn your way on how to navigate through art stores or um or bookstores and how to find like just uh, different things to either emulate from so like with her stuff because she has art books she doesn't i don't actually believe she has one actual book on how to but when you when you go into a bookstore specifically or an art store but mostly a bookstore you do uh, learn where to find frank frazetta uh, stuff or uh books by Olivia and stuff like that. And when I uh, popped her stuff open, I was like, oh my God. I felt like such a loser with trying to do my comic book stuff and any any type of realistic drawings. It wasn't even close. And then, you know, you look at her stuff and you're just like, oh my God. She, From what I can tell out of uh, all her stuff, she's on Instagram too. She's consistently making stuff, constantly, all the time, and I'm just blown away, and I don't even know how she does it. Um, she's just a masterful person, but every picture every picture I've seen of hers in whatever book, or even online, it's top-notch, 100%, and it grabbed me, it pulled me in, it was very intriguing. Now, I've only seen her draw or paint or sketch women i've never seen her do anything uh, in terms of a masculine figure ever and that's not a complaint i'm just saying and if you're a younger artist like i am and like i mentioned before in previous episodes you always try to emulate first and then it's many years later at least for me it was many years later and i think for most people especially people that don't have confidence in what they're doing you emulate maybe for way longer than you should and you're just trying to draw what the people that you uh, appreciate, the people that you inspire to be, you tr you try to draw all their stuff without really trying to draw your own stuff. And that's where I think a lot of artists make a really big mistake. And with her, I kind of did the same thing. Not on the painting level, but just uh, popping open a book and then setting the book off to my left and then on to my right, I would try to sketch the figure as good as possible. And even doing that, it, uh, it didn't look good. But uh, her art books are Betty Page, Malibu Cheesecake, American Geisha, The Art of Olivia, Second Slice, The Art of Olivia, Olivia's Cheeca Cheesecake Chronicles, uh, a whole bunch of calendars, uh, specifically, again, on her website. And the most famous, I think, she's uh, known for is Let Them Eat Cheesecake. And that's the book that I bought a long time ago. And, you know, now, you know, when, when I look at her stuff, everything looks print worthy. And I mean, I mean that when you, if you want to buy a poster, whether it's of a person or a movie, there's certain versions or certain uh, models or cameramen or poses that just don't look good. And it's, it's nothing against the whole process overall, but sometimes it's just not as cool as something else. With every single one of her fucking things. And, you know, she did have a few things that I just didn't like, maybe, uh, artistically how she went about it. But they all looked good. They all looked like they were worthy to be printed as a fucking 20 by 30 poster or whatever the size is of a poster. I have no idea. And that's, that's one of the things that always 
really stayed with me as I got older as an artist. And then now I kind of hold myself up to that st same standard as if like when I'm taking pictures, for example. And again, this is what we're talking about, you know, how it inspired me. When I take pictures from from any angle or any intensity, by the end of the day, if I'm done editing and it, I, I don't think for people that appreciate my work, somebody wouldn't either want to spend money on it or even if they got it for free, wouldn't want to have it in you know in their naughty binder or or you know propped up on somewhere or hanging from a wall. And I, and again, this is usually I also have these feelings for myself. Then I'm just like it's not it's not good enough or it's not worth it. Or whatever. Um, her art looks intense and it looks soft at the same time. Everything is always very feminine. With uh, with her with her subject matter always being female, and uh, her color palette is all over the place. Sometimes it's more intense than others, but she somehow always finds a way to make the figure pop. She always has like either an outline around it or some, some sort of shape or color behind the figure that just makes it bold or, or want to pop off the canvas. That's something that I, I never mastered when I was an artist and I would just try to like draw things or paint things. I had a, a, a decent idea on how to do it. But over the years uh, as an artist, I just got really lazy. But now I, I'm kind of doing that in another manner with, uh, taking really strong photographs or or even making uh, you know my videos and whatnot but if you look at her uh, with the way that she would work with all of her females they were always very proportionate everything was very um, natural uh, very natural so nobody out of all of her subjects had like gigantic tits or gigantic asses or super thick thighs it was always very I was within a certain um, degree or a certain range. She never really went out of uh, what I would maybe consider to be a more modest approach towards. Uh, and again, it's pinup, so you can. I'm, I'm sure anybody listening, whenever you think of anything pinup, the calves are always just a little bit larger than you might get from your average chick. Uh, the the legs are just a tiny bit thicker. The waist is always very uh, cinched. And you have like average shoulders, and sometimes you either have like uh, banana style tits or torpedo tits. And I'm not, I don't say that to be mean or funny or anything like that, but strictly just the shape of either them curving up at the bottom and pointing up, or them simply jutting straight out. Most of these women seem to be curated because they didn't have like big, heavy fucking milkers. Um, they all seem like the very uh, same type of model or whatever. Um, let's see. What else did I... Uh, the background is, was never really always... It was never really that busy. In fact, there's many backgrounds she, she has with within her books if you want to you know buy one or even like look online at some of her work. Where it's just white canvas behind the, the woman that she painted. And sometimes you do get like a wild uh, brush stroke just going through... Obviously, behind the subject, sometimes you get like this weird, these this box or rectangle or circle that that might be colored in, or, and then sometimes they get really ornate with all these uh, crazy details and whatnot. But most of the time, it was uh, pretty straightforward. But the thing overall that I took away from her is to just make whatever I'm doing really pop and really jut out, similar to the stuff that I said about Lady Gaga, and um, the biggest thing again to say it one more time. As if 15 times it wasn't enough, is to have all my angles look appealing. Now, with Olivia, her overall variety of poses doesn't change that much. It's always, most of the poses are all within, probably all the poses are all within the very basic, prominent um, pinup style poses you get to where maybe they're. They're sitting up with their with their legs up off the uh, ground, and then they're leaned back, and you can you see three quarters of their body, and, and sometimes they're pointed a little bit more off to the side, sometimes they're pointed a little bit more forward, and then sometimes they're standing uh, towards you or away, but they're never really doing like um, like spread eagle or, or a rear naked uh, shot with their, just their ass or something like that. It's never anything like that. It's always very tasteful. All right, so this next one. I actually was going to put 
and uh, what was it? The uh, episode, what thirteen, of um, the inspirations and whatnot. But I I was running so long with time, I was like, ah, fuck it, I'll just cut it. But uh, it was very late getting to this movie. It was a cult classic, or it it, it is a cult classic. The film is Natural Born Killers, which is an action crime drama, and it's just uh, pretty insane. It came out in 1994, and over the years, I think I had seen a few scenes from it, but for whatever reason, for whatever reason, this movie and also Scarface, I just didn't give a shit about until I was much later in life, for whatever reason. I, I had heard people talk about this movie. I knew its name. If I were to see the cover, I could be like, oh yeah, that's what that movie's called. I never watched it. Other than maybe seeing a few snippets of it. Um, it was either something just took me away or I just uh, was too busy. I don't know what my issue was, but I didn't watch it until just before I sold my house. So like about three years ago or something. And I'm 38, so that you figure that's pretty late getting to a movie that... Uh, you know, came out around 1994, and I, I've seen all these other movies, and you think this would be right up there. But, yeah, like I said, I just didn't see it until several years ago. Um, anyways, but I eventually got around to watching it, and, you know, I was like, how the fuck did this not happen? This movie's crazy as fuck. So, get this. I guess it was originally written by Quentin Tarantino, but from what I could tell, it was so far, by the time they actually turned it into a movie, with the screenplay and everything, and how they directed it, it was so far from his actual writing that he didn't even want the credit on the movie. But uh, apparently that's that's just knowledge that everybody knows about um, Natural Born Killers. Uh, so it's starring, starring Juliette Lewis as Mallory Knox. Woody Harrelson as Mickey Knox, Robert Downey Jr. as Wayne Gale, and um, Tom Sizemore as Jack Skag Skagnetti, which is the detective in the movie. Rodney Dangerfield is in it as um, Mallory Knox's father. And then Tommy Lee Jones plays a warden in the prison. And uh, it's about two people that had a traumatic childhood and they were abused and stuff like that. And just through life circumstances, they meet each other. They become lovers. Uh, they they kill her parents. And I, I had to kind of look up the term of what they were doing. I originally had the term mass murderer, but apparently that's not correct. So serial murderer seems to be more an appropriate uh, term. And sometimes they would go on these killing sprees. But they, with the way that the movie portrays it, it didn't seem like they would go on killing sprees just to go on killing sprees per se. Um, you know, although they would do it in an almost casual uh, fashion. But it seems like if people just got in their way that were either uh, kind of like of age, because they didn't really show them killing anybody that didn't need to be killed other than one specific situation, which they in the movie actually had regrets about. Uh, because the movie goes into detail later in the movie that they were aware of right and wrong. They just didn't give a fuck, which is which is very telling. And once you kind of have that information going in and then you rewatch the movie, you're just like, oh, OK, it, it makes a whole bunch of sense. Um, the movie um, is the definition of dynamic. <laughs> Nothing is ever quiet or relaxed. Scenes are constantly interrupted with a rotating or swooping camera movement. In addition to that, there are these tiny little snippets that uh, that just cut to a character similar to that of Rob Zombie's House of a Thousand Corpses, where it, it just uh, adds to the movie. And sometimes it's like stock footage that's black and white. Other times it's like this weird colored footage. Sometimes it's footage from the movie from a different angle or it's not from the movie at all or it's from like a commercial and it seems to add to that sick dimension that the character lives in it usually shows them acting crazy or covered in blood or something like that just then just goes right back to the scene like nothing happened almost like it was an uh alternative of what could be happening or what's about to happen or what could have happened or something that's going to tell you something about the characters in the future 
it's constantly shifting from color to black and white. Most of these scenes are usually past moments from their childhood or earlier in their relationship. And then when that's not happening, uh, a certain scene will be washed over with just a single color. There are several scenes that are just all green. These scenes are usually seem to be some way to exhibit a certain tension or emotion. Even then, when it sh uh, will still shift uh, to black and white, uh, it's sometimes it just doesn't really seem to have any rhyme or reason. And then every so often, an animation will pop out out of nowhere. These animation scenes were created by the same animator that did Eon Flux, Peter Chung. The entire movie seems to be saturated with uh, a heavy soundtrack, constantly new, new songs. Uh, I'm, I don't I don't mean new as in the time that they came out, although I think they were more uh, recent when that happened, obviously. But uh, just like all the other movies that I mentioned earlier, or like the the series on Netflix, it's it always adds to the scenes. There are very few moments that don't have an actual song or thematic music or some kind or of some kind. Uh, now take that into account and then add some dramatic lighting, like I mentioned, from the Rob Zombie concerts or movies, and, and it intensifies and extremes the close-ups. It, it makes everything really wonky sometimes. This movie is exciting. It just doesn't let up. It's like a cocaine-filled emotional ride. Uh, you get the sense that these characters actually l love each other. That's one of the things that I found to be weird with this movie and also weird with House of a Thousand Corpses or Devil's Rejects is you're actually starting to root you're starting to root for people that are just you kind after a while you just can't make excuses for them and you're kind of like dude what the fuck but uh, yeah um, you find yourself rooting for them to be together and get free because they eventually wind up in prison uh, regardless of, of the actions that they have towards the general public you feel for them. With what is uh, represented in the movie, even the pedestrians seem angry, mean, and, and tainted. So it seems like even people that they come across that aren't in their wake of destruction, they're just kind of assholes or, or shitty people. Uh, so that kind of, for whatever reason, it kind of adds to the world. Um, but eventually in the movie, they get caught up in their own chaos. They get captured, wind up in prison, and eventually escape. Oh, I'm sorry I said that. I'm... I'm talking out of turn of my notes because I just can't help myself. So if I'm saying the same thing twice, I apologize. Uh, the ending credits are loaded with imagery and show them in the future with a, a family that seems to be happy. So the as the movie's ending, it's Mickey and Mallory Knox in a camper with, I think, a baby and two kids or something like that. And they just seem to be like a happy family. So it seems like they, it seems like they stopped everything that happened to them. Um, but the things that inspired me from this movie, uh, I think there's a few of them here, one, two, three, four of them, before we go on to the next one. The cutscenes that uh, that go from color to black and white, it wasn't necessarily jarring, although it was disorienting for sure. <clears throat> Sorry, I got the sniffles. It took value away from the color and made it uh, much more of a concentration on the scene and the actors, not necessarily the environment. I want to experiment with this more than what I do. The furthest thing I've gone with uh, the black and white has been with photos. I have with only uh, with the exception of I think a couple videos or something like that. Plus, I feel like with my particular style, it will be a fun thing to add to my tool belt in terms of editing and feelings uh, and feeling for the viewer. <coughs> also, the extreme lighting and uh, from the foreground uh, versus the background. There are plenty of scenes. And I just recently watched this again to, to make these notes. I made I finished these notes like last night. But um, there were plenty of scenes that had red light cast onto the actor in the foreground. And then in the background, there was like a blue light seeming uh, in the background to create some sort of a contrast. Um, and intensified the act in the moment. It was usually when a character was about to act on someone. But it made it seem very vivid and uh, in a dreamlike sense. The other thing I really had that um, I used was uh, the camera and how energetic it was. It was above, below, moving from side to side. And you could tell that sometimes it was uh, the camera operator was holding it on the shoulder in many scenes. Like sometimes you see that in movies where it's running and it's jumping all over the place. Obviously gives everything movement then because you're... It, 
can make everything seem um, much more physical. It added to the frenzy and aggression in the film. I don't practice much of this, but I do employ it sparingly. You know, when I'm uh, and you know in my videos to to add or give a, an extra sense to the viewer or something like that. Sometimes I'm holding the camera. And again, when I'm talking about my OnlyFans videos, yes, sometimes I do hold the camera when I'm riding a dildo or I'm doing a self facial or something like that, and the camera shakes a little bit, but uh, adds a little bit more intensity. And I I, oh, I I do like to add a sense of realism, like maybe somebody's right there with me watching me or even performing the act on me. And lastly, I love how they flooded certain scenes with just a single color. I'm not sure if this was a lens thing or if it's something they did in the editing room, but uh, it's something that I would really like to experiment with. My issue is the lack of uh, overall lighting. I feel like I can do a much better job in terms of uh, directing uh, lighting, but it's something that I have my eye on constantly. So that's that's just a critique for my own work more than anything else. Obviously, I don't have a full studio backing me. But uh, that's just that's just me critiquing myself. All right, we're almost done. Linnea Quigley, born May 27th, 1958. She's from Davenport, Iowa. Cute tiny blonde. Measurements 33, 22, 33 with the C cup. She's five foot two, weighs 99 pounds. I say all that to say that she was the scream queen of the 80s with 173 credits with multiple movies almost every single year. She didn't slow down until about uh, the 2000s, and her filmography starts from 1975. And if you go to her IMDb page, from like 1975 all the way up to fucking recently, I would say her average movie per year has to be like three. Uh, I'm just scanning through this. Like in her first few years, she didn't do too much per year, but once she got to like 1984, 1985, all the way up to like, fuck. Yeah, she didn't slow down until about 2000. But especially like uh, 84 to 88, she was doing like three to five movies a year. And again, a lot of these are smaller scenes and not big budget films. Uh, but she was a bad bitch. The list of movies I saw her in, I haven't seen all of her stuff. Because like I said, she has 173 uh, screen credits. But uh, the first thing I seen was Night of the Demons that came out in 1988. She played Suzanne. The Return of the Living Dead, 1985. She played a character called Trash. <laughs> she uh, was some street punk. Uh, Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers, 1988 as Samantha. Nightmare Sisters, uh, 1988 as Melody. And Sorority Babes and the Slime Ball Arama, 1988 as Spider. All these fucking movies that I've seen so far were amazing. Every single one of her movies I saw so far, I could say that she got the assignment. She uh, she could play dumb, horny, silly, goofy, aggressive, scared. Everything she did, I loved. The reason I gave her measurements like I did was because she sold herself very well. The Return of the Living Dead, she had a nude scene that lasted a few minutes. It was very prominent. It was uh, again. I came. I didn't fully watch this movie up until several several months ago like about a year ago or something like that and i was like dude how did i not see this so long ago um the movie lasted several minutes she started stripping in the graveyard and you know uh she's talking to one of the characters that's sitting next to her on a uh, tombstone because they're they're punks just looking for something to do apparently they were trying to go to some party or something like that and one of their friends was working and they were waiting for him to get out so they were just killing time basically no pun intended and uh as she's taking her clothes off, one, uh, one of the characters off camera is like, she's doing it again. And this uh, this this music pops up and uh, it starts playing. And she's walking away from the camera as she's stripping. And her her back is incredibly toned. And again, keep in mind, she's a, she's a tiny, skinny person with amazingly perky tits. Her, her back is incredibly toned. Her legs are, and her waist are perfect. Uh... With all of her movies, I with all the stuff that I mentioned, she has a topless scene. And every single time, uh, I'm just like, oh my god. I hang out with my buddy Mark that I mentioned several times on the podcast. And for the past, I don't know, month and a half, two months, we've been hanging out every single weekend. Mostly watching 80s movies, and specifically horror movies from the 80s. And we both have a love of uh, Leanna Quigley. 
um and we we constantly joke about uh you know every every time she you know she comes on screen we kind of get silent and just watch her do her thing it, when she's having a nude scene and you know again even though I'm a cross dresser and I haven't started transitioning yet I'm still I still like women I uh that's that's mostly what I like and you know to have like a little bit of that like uh locker room talk or just to hang out with one of my guy friends and just stare at perfect perky tits from Leanna Quigley it's uh you know again after like the scenes we both kind of like laugh about it because we always uh say that there's a particular thing with uh women in the 80s with tits and he mentioned that they like yeah they all have banana boobs and I I didn't ever think about that as a thing or uh torpedo tits you know banana boobs being that they they uh point up at the at the bottom and kind of uh either go outwards or upwards but they have like a lift to them which makes them look like super perky and looks like they have like a little bit of weight and torpedo tits obviously just pointing straight out and we kind of we kind of made a thing of it so it's like oh who you know who are we going to see in this 80s horror movie or something like that but with Leanna Quigley it's just always funny and silly and with her with all of her characters it's like she dials everything to 11 with all the stereotypes God damn notifications going off. Anyways, um, but w- watching her stuff and watching all of her characters, it really, it really had me think. Uh, how much can you lean into something in terms of like uh, your character and whatnot? And it got me thinking about, you know, synthetic, like my alter ego, the other side that I would like to be more of, or even full time. Um, you know, with her. Uh, Suzanne, the Night of the Demons, they were all going to a Halloween party, and she was dressed up in some pink uh, dress or something like that. And she just always has these lines like, oh, you know, let's, I thought we were going to hang out with the boys or something like that. She just, with most of her roles, they're not made to be taken seriously. You know what I mean? She's not trying to win an Academy Award, but the, the campiness and the 80s just B-rated stuff that she pulls off is just really funny and entertaining. Um, she also has a movie about... Uh, it's in Night of the Demons. She She's in the... Uh, what is She's in like some sort of convenience store, and like she's keeping these guys occupied. She's like bent over in front of them, and her friend is stealing a bunch of stuff, putting it in her Halloween bag. And her friend walks out, and she's like, all right, I'm ready to go. And she gets the nod, she's like, okay, right behind you kind of thing. And she's talking to the two clerks, and they're just, like, staring at her ass. And again, she's really hot. She's fucking hot, especially in her younger years. And she's like, do you boys have sour balls? And, and, she, and they're like, yes, ma'am. And she's like, too bad. I bet you don't get a lot of blowjobs. But the way she says it, it's it's sexy because it's so far in the bimbo category I can't help but to just be like, that's fucking sexy. With Trash, like I said, where she was doing that uh, stripping scene, it, it's just incredibly sexy. Like, she she got the assignment. With uh, Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers, which was just absolutely hysterical. It's this weird kind of detective noir thing, and she plays some, like, innocent girl or something like that. And again, she just has, like, unnecessary uh like nude scenes and with that movie with nightmare sisters and sorority babes i believe it's the same three girls in all three films oh no that's not totally correct uh one of them isn't in the slime ball orama but uh nightmare sisters and sorority babes uh they all have these like extended really uh, no reason nudity scenes that's just fucking hilarious and now that i've discovered them and that it's a thing i kind of want to see what everything else what uh what all these other movies have to offer because everything that my buddy mark has picked out that i'm like let's do silly 80s horror movie they're all over the top and just insane uh with the exception of night of the demons and return of the living dead none of them really were all that famous for being uh quality now I would say all these movies that I mentioned, they're definitely cult classics by now. Especially, you know, Night of the Demons and Return of the Living Dead or whatever. But uh, 
<coughs> with uh, I think what it was, Nightmare Sisters. They they all have their own. I believe. Hang on here. Let me pull this up. I actually want to look at this here. Do 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 do. It was. I think it was Nightmare Sisters. She was living with her friends. And um, they're all playing like fucking idiots or whatever. And something something happens with uh, the movie. Hang on here. I can't talk and type at the same time. <laughs> Hang on. I want to give you a quick, uh, quick detail. Fuck. Yeah, okay. So they're in a sorority and they're uh, trying to get a party and they're all trying to get three other guys that are just as nerdy and as fucking dumb as they are. But the thing that caught me off guard with this movie is as soon as the movie starts, you can tell that all three girls are fucking dumb. They don't look attractive at all. The 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 taller one, they make her look schlubby and fat and she's always wearing just like overly sized clothes and they're making her eat like in every single scene. There's this uh there's this like pippy like little mouse one that's just as uh skinny as uh Linnea, and uh, then there's Linnea, which she plays like a total dumb dweeb and like nerd, and they all look extremely unattractive with the way that their uh, the, the clothes fit and everything. <clears throat> they 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 get possessed by some sex demon or something like that, and then they start to uh, their personalities change. They strip off all their clothes, and they look fucking drop dead gorgeous. If you look up Nightmare Sisters and maybe even look the look up the preview for the movie and you could probably find the whole movie on fucking YouTube for free if you look. I'm I'm guessing. I'm like holy shit. Now, it's a little bit different flavor like once they change, once they get possessed because then she's much more sexually aggressive and they're just eating the men because and all the scenes with the, uh where they get uh with like the guys alone because three other guys from a, the same sorority as these nerdy guys show up. They eat those motherfuckers with, fuckers with sharp teeth and everything, and it's uh, it's pretty crazy. But um, sorority babes and slime ball arama, and the slime ball arama she plays spider, and uh, she's basically breaking into um, what is it, a bowling alley or something like that. She was, she's a little bit tougher, a little bit smarter. She has more grit to her. But again, she she leans into that that bimbo thing when it's uh, when it's time to happen. Hang on here. Do, do, do. Uh, sorority sisters and slime ball at Rama. Yeah. So, uh, she, she's not with the initial cast when the, the whole movie starts, but then she gets like locked in with them and then they come across some, some gin or or demon or something like that. And again, it's with just a, a bunch of unnecessary nudity that even in a, uh, in a bowling alley, they, they find way to get people naked and just start doing crazy stuff. And I, I love every single bit of it, but like, I, like the point I was getting back to before is I started thinking about parts of my alter ego. And again, everything that I've presented so far, whether it's on this podcast or on my Instagram, or or Twitter, or OnlyFans, Pornhub, X Hamster, blah blah blah. I haven't, I haven't overemphasized anything for the sake of overemphasizing or trying to sell a product. I've always just me. It's always been me selling myself, and um, I haven't uh, tried to like uh, just be over the top with anything unnecessarily. But it got me thinking, you know, like, what would that look like? Could I have a different way to uh, maybe express my sexuality if I were to do that uh, that silly Linnea Quigley thing of just, uh, you know, doing that, doing that bimbo thing that, uh, I, I, you know, I mentioned it before, doing that, uh, doing the bimbo thing of just like, oh, yeah, oh, my God, like, what would that look like? What would that feel like? Would that be would that be overly silly? And if it was, would it be a bad thing? Um, so I I honestly gave it some thought, and I was seriously considering. I don't know if I I don't know if I'll do this because it's not really naturally it's not my brand. However, because 
the OnlyFans videos are what they are, I have been having deeper thoughts with this whole B-rated 80s horror, like overly sexual kind of thing. And I, I think it would be funny to really explore. But how many of you listening to this have watched the the hypno videos or some sort of trans bimbos getting fucked real hard and you know, sometimes they're they're getting fucked so hard they do that anime thing with their mouth and their eyeballs, and they they're just look like, they look like they're getting fucked silly. Or sometimes you just watch any type of porno, whether it's gay, straight, whatever, and um, it's it's overly being sold for the straight male. Like, oh my god, your cock is so big. Oh my god, fuck me, daddy, like that. Now I've I've seen plenty of scenes. Uh. Even like with Natalie Mars or something like that, where her she just looks like she's losing her mind, and I'm like, you know what? That seems like it'd be a fun uh, spectrum to explore with myself. Now, it being obviously synthetic and to sell products or whatever, I I don't know how popular it would be, but I I do think the more the more time I I think about this and even talking about it, now I'm like, you know what? I kind of want to get one of these fuckers made and just be over the top and just. Do this whole Linnea Quigley thing, just acting like a fucking bimbo, riding on one of my dildos, or just jerking off all over my sa- uh, all over my face, just saying ridiculous shit. I think that would be fucking uh, pretty funny. I really do. Uh, but that is it for the third installment of all my inspirations. Um, God, I got like five pages of notes. Uh. So if you have anything that you would like to share with some of the stuff that inspires you with your cross-dressing, whether it's pictures, videos, or even just thoughts that never leave your head because you just don't feel like it's safe to, what's some of the stuff that rolls through your head? You can you can leave me a long email if you want or a short email. The next episode is going to be uh, one of the spicier ones. Um, episode 42, I'm going to talk about all my social media follows. Now, whether that's Instagram, Twitter, FetLife, or not FetLife, uh, that's probably going to be too personal, but um, just porn people that I follow, anybody and everybody that I think is worth mentioning, I'm going to talk about, so uh, be prepared for that. And again, this is going to be specifically about cross-dressers, trans, and anything porn and um, not safe for work. So if you want to get some of the spicy people that I follow, maybe stuff that I find attractive by... Uh, you know, people, I just love their product, you know, uh, get ready for that one. So, uh, original sin one, three, six, nine at gmail.com. I hope you had fun. I'll talk to you later, sissies. Bye.